Today we are going to wrap up the 1930s chapter before we get you into World War II next week. Um, we've talked a lot about how the government got involved and how life's pe or people's lives were affected by uh, the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl for that matter. So I thought it best to also take a look at what does culture look like during this time. As we left off in the 1920s, movies where people are speaking are a big thing. Um, movie theaters were a big thing. How does that change? Or rather, how does it evolve? So we'll start out at the top here with movies. Um, they're cheap. Is movies are maybe a nickel. Um, so roughly the cost of half a loaf of bread-ish. Um, it's easy for people to get to, and as the president starts to implement New Deal policies, it's affordable for them to get back to going to see movies. And it's escapism, pure and simple. Is Rather than thinking, oh no, what's going to happen next, is this gives people two, sometimes four hours, to get out of all the sort of doldrums of the 1930s and think of something happier. Um, so normally movies are going to work one of probably two ways. You'll either get a double feature, which is one movie, a couple cartoons in the middle, and then another movie. So it's basically, hey, there's your Saturday afternoon right there. Or what will happen is you'll have newsreels that come up beforehand, and then you will have just sort of one big movie. Um, both kind of depend on the individual theater you're at. They break down into basically two different types. Um, first of all, we've got escapist comedies here. So this is stuff like the Marx Brothers, which evolves out of vaudeville theater. So these are, you know, slapstick comics and mimes that would have been up on stage, and they're going to adjust their sort of comedy for film. Um, there's a lot of good stuff out there. It's available on YouTube. You've got time right now. If you like that, like really anything funny, is the Marx Brothers are a good place to start. Disney cartoons are going to escalate in the 1930s. Um, late 1920s saw the inception of Mickey uh, with Steamboat Willie. He is going to beat out another character whose name is something ridiculous like Wilbur the Rabbit or something like that, um, who is Disney's first idea. We're going to switch over to Mickey, and then eventually the larger Disney family will come in. Uh, we're not talking fully animated movies yet, but lots and lots of shorts. And as time goes on, and as you'll see in the next chapter, uh, Disney's going to get into a pretty profitable relationship with the government in making informational films using their characters. Um, Looney Tunes are going to start popping up around now as well. Uh, they're a little behind Disney, but both very popular. Also a big thing here, musicals and dancing. Uh, this is Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. The, they were sort of the um, song and dance couple of the 1930s. Both very, very talented. Uh, the movie that's from, I believe, is Top Hat, which is actually pretty funny. It's worth your time. Um, but again, this is about escapism. These are two rich, talented, happy people having a good time together and singing songs about how they're having a good time while they dance better than you could ever hope to dance. Um, very popular. Your grandparents probably loved these movies, or your great-grandparents, my grandparents. Anyway. The other stuff that comes out is a whole lot of drama, is films are really changing at this time. We've gone from Birth of a Nation um, and The Jazz Singer to a whole lot more nuance and a whole lot of different stuff. So you'll see The Grapes of Wrath, which will adapt to the book that we talked about um, earlier in this chapter uh, by John Steinbeck, that will go into very candid detail about how awful um, life for Okies was getting out of the Dust Bowl and coming to California. Um, that one's a big hit. Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. I've left you guys a clip right here. I'm not going to play it right now because I think it's sort of inception -y to watch a YouTube video of watching a YouTube video. But it's there. Uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington is a movie directed by Frank Capra, who is the big director at the time. Um, his big thing was sort of hope and the human spirit. Um, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington is about a politician who is elected as a representative to go, I'm sorry, as a senator, to go to um, Washington, D.C. and realizes how corrupt everything is there and uh, filibusters until a bill um, is fixed, essentially. Um, and sort of he's going to portray the everyman hero in America 
is between Mr. Smith and Tom Joad of the Grapes of Wrath. That's sort of going to epitomize the every man doing the best he can for Americans that is really going to be sort of the theme of dramatic films at this time. You'll also see a bunch of gangster movies, The Public Enemy with James Cagney, um, which if you ever watch a clip of that, again, available on YouTube, um, you'll see where every, eh, what are you doing, punk, sort of gangster accent that you've ever heard comes from. It's from The Public Enemy. You're also going to get horror movies for the first time. You will get Frankenstein, The Wolfman, Dracula, um, all of these done by Universal. Um, Universal is trying to bring all these characters back, except the old movies are way better. You will also get special effects for the first time. And when I say special effects, what do I mean? Why, I mean this right here, King Kong. Um, this is going to be a blockbuster. And I know you've heard that term before. What this literally meant is people get so excited to go see these movies that they would stand all around the block and you wouldn't be able to get past them. They had busted the block, as it were. Um, these movies are wildly successful and Hollywood's really going to explode at this time. Beforehand, um, basically instead of previews, you would get newsreels. So rather than just a radio news report, you're going to have somebody there filming um, what was happening around the country or around the world. So people might be getting updates on what was happening in Japan or in Germany at the time. Um, kind of the precursor to the modern day news. These would be cut down and spread around, but this is a good way for people to sort of stay up on current events. There would also be a bunch of stuff is, you know, hey, here's all the great stuff the CCC is doing right now or the WPA, something like that, to uh, show people kind of what was happening in America as well. Next up, we've got radio. So radio has become basically a standard in everybody's house at this point. Um, not the little ones that you see, you know, sitting on like someone's bedside table. These are the size of a file cabinet. And depending on how large the signal is, it might be a local radio station that can only be heard for 50 miles around, or it could be like those border blasters that Russell talked about in class that will go for hundreds of miles, if not thousands of miles in a few extreme cases. And what they will do is they will basically entertain the masses is you don't have tv at this point tv is just starting to become a thing and they're not in most houses yet so you will hear plays over the radio um, some of them paid for by the government and the works progress administration um, the most famous one of these is this one right here this is orson wells he will go on to make one of the best movies of all time. Some people, me, might say the second best movie of all time in Citizen Kane. Um, he produced War of the Worlds. Uh, War of the Worlds, if you are not familiar with it, is an old H.G. Wells story, but instead of just talking about an alien invasion and reading off the story, what Orson Welles did is he portrayed the entire thing as a news report and people allegedly freaked out all over the country. There's, there's old wives tales of people having heart attacks and dying. It's not that extreme, but there are newspaper headlines that exist from the time about how freaked out people were that, oh no, aliens have landed in New Jersey and you know are zapping stuff. And then about two hours into this four hour radio play, it switches to like six months later and people finally catch on if they hadn't already. Oh, this is a radio play and I'm just having fun with it. But Big, big, big deal. Orson Welles has to apologize on national radio afterwards. It's a whole thing. Um, yeah, it, it's pretty impressive. You're also going to have serials. So basically, instead of a TV show that you would watch every week, you would have a serial. So The Adventures of the Lone Ranger, and it would talk about the Lone Ranger and his you know, faithful companion Tonto going out and solving crimes in the Old West or Amos and Andy, which was a far more problematic show about two white guys pretending to be black guys and um, getting up to all sorts of quote unquote hijinks. Um, it sounds horrible now. It was not looked upon poorly at the time. People were pretty okay with it. But um, boy, you know what? When television came about, they tried to do an Amos and Andy TV show. Didn't go so well. Um, there's all sorts of stuff like this, though. As, I mean, there's Superman serials. There's a series called The Shadow, which they made a movie out of with Alec Baldwin in the 90s that was terrible. Um, but The Shadow knows, and he solves crimes, and, you know, wears a mask and shoots bad guys, and there's sound effects and all this stuff, and it really gets people's attention. 
And what would happen is these cereals would be sponsored. So it would be sponsored by Coca-Cola, sponsored by, you know, Nestle chocolate milk, whatever. And everybody would turn in or tune in every night for that sort of stuff. Um, very popular people huddled around the radio, which is why when Franklin Roosevelt made those uh, fireside chats that everybody was so used to it is this was kind of how they engaged with the wider world already. So when the president gets in on it, all the better. Um, also, the news is going to go out and the news is going to become a larger and larger part of American life. It's not just in newspapers anymore. You can listen to it at night as well. There will be interview programs, all that good stuff. Not the only person doing this by far, but Dorothea Lange, this woman right up here, is very, very, very famous at the time. Um, she is going to take money from the WPA and go photograph America. So if you look at the po picture on, I believe it is the right side of the uh, title slide for um, this chapter, you will see that picture was taken by Dorothea Lange. And she is going to be one of about a dozen, two dozen photographers that go out and cover America and sort of show what America looked like in the 1930s. So most of our sense of what sort of the American experience in the 1930s was is thanks to photographers who are then um, giving those pictures to the government. The government is in turn letting uh, newspapers or magazines or books have access to them to show what's happening around the world to everybody else. Um, next up, and sort of the last big cultural thing of the 1930s before World War II is going to start up, is the 1936 Berlin Olympics. Um, Berlin, obviously the capital of Germany, um, which is totally in the sway of Adolf Hitler at this point. Adolf Hitler, big into the myth of Aryan superiority, so if you have blonde hair, blue eyes, you look Nordic, then clearly you are the apex of humanity, and nothing uh, can defeat you except you know, another athlete. And this is where America comes in, specifically with one Jesse Owens right here, who arrives at the Berlin Olympics and absolutely just houses the Germans. Um, he wins again and again and again. And for the most part, is pretty widely respected by the German athletes. On the other hand, Adolf Hitler refused to shake his hand when he won the gold medal, which is very on brand for Adolf Hitler, being a terrible person all. So Jesse Owens is there and sort of the world sees that, hey, Hitler's talking a whole lot of mess here, and clearly none of it is true. So as we talked about earlier, how eugenics was not an actual science, and that was all sort of made up. It's, it's the same thing with this myth of Aryan superiority, is Jesse Owens is going to completely smoke that. Remember, any questions or clarifications on any of this, leave a comment in the YouTube stuff, and next week I'll, do, um, I'll go through and I'll, I will answer all of that for you guys. All right, one more slide to go. Chase, get excited. This is for you, buddy. Not everything is great in the New Deal. We've talked about this a little bit already, but by the time Franklin Roosevelt's second term is wrapping up, things are starting to slide pretty quickly, as exemplified by this political cartoon right here. Um, one of the big things that the New Deal was trying to do was, quote unquote, prime the pump which meant that if the government provided enough jobs that paid enough people, that would sort of set the economy back on the right track and everything would work out. Um, the problem is, is that some of those policies didn't work and some of them were illegal and had to be stopped before they could make a massive impact. And that's what this cartoon is referring to right here is, hey, we've spent $16 billion on this, but most of it's leaking out. That pump is not primed. You're not going to get a whole lot of success out of this. But 7,000 millions is another $7 billion, and the taxpayer is on the hook for this. So despite how high taxes have gone, it's still not fixing the problem. And that's what we're going to look at in this last slide is sort of the less heralded dark side of the New Deal. So away we go. The big thing, and this is what Chase kept asking me about last week, and unfortunately, I'm not here to uh, talk with you guys about it more. Um, Franklin Roosevelt is going to get very, very fed up with the Supreme Court constantly declaring that most of the stuff from his New Deal was unconstitutional. So he comes up with a solution. The Constitution does not say how many judges are supposed to sit on the Supreme Court. It's actually up to Congress to determine that. We started out with six. We're currently up to nine. We've been at nine for a long time. We were at nine during the, uh, the Great Depression. So what Franklin Roosevelt decides to do, because these judges just are not listening to him, 
and because they don't have to, they're judges, they're impartial, um, is he says, all right, here's what I want to do. I want to add a new judge to the Supreme Court for every judge who does not require after the age of 70. At this point, that would have been adding six new judges to the Supreme Court, all of whom, of course, would be appointed by Franklin Roosevelt and presumably um, appointed to the Supreme Court or have that appointment approved by the Senate, which was Democrat at the time. So on paper, this sounds like a great deal for Franklin Roosevelt, but this is how the entire country looks at it right here. Those judges would be puppets. As a result, they would not be impartial. They would be people completely under the sway of Franklin Roosevelt. They would not be the impartial judges in the Supreme Court at the time. What Franklin Roosevelt did, and this is the low moment of his presidency, bar none, is he did not tell his vice president, who is the what is called the vice president, or I'm sorry, the president of the Senate. He is technically in charge of the Senate. Um, he just handed it off to him and said, hey, John Nance Garner of Texas, here's this bill I want to pass. I need you to pass it basically sight unseen. I'm going to drop it off in your office in the morning, and I expect it to be passed by the Senate in the House later this week. Everybody is aghast by this. The House of Representatives refuses to pass it. John Nance Garner is so offended by what Franklin Roosevelt has done that he refuses to speak to him for the rest of the presidential term and refuses to run with him when Franklin Roosevelt is going to run for a third term. It's bad. Um, it's also going to show a whole bunch of rifts within the Democratic Party. So some Democrats are from the South, some are from the North. They have different goals. And they've all been sort of holding those goals at bay because they believe Franklin Roosevelt's acting in the best interest of the country. But here, in what is a nakedly political move, this is not helping the country, this is helping Franklin Roosevelt. Um, all of these splits sort of show up. And his credibility is going to be kind of ripped to shreds here. People aren't going to be very happy with what Franklin Roosevelt has done. Um, to the degree where basically by the time this happens, he's already passed the Social Security Act and that good stuff in the Works Progress Administration. Franklin Roosevelt's not really going to pass any more domestic legislation for the remainder of his presidency. Um, so if World War II doesn't come about, he probably is not getting reelected for a third term. Um, he's still well liked in the country, but his credibility and his ability to pass laws is virtually destroyed at this point. What else is happening that's getting on people's nerves? Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, very, very public role is the first lady. Um, unlike virtually anything we've ever seen, really. Um, we've discussed this earlier, kind of at the beginning of the chapter. She's very popular with a large section of America. She is sort of Franklin's eyes and ears. They're much more partners now as president and first lady than husband and wife. They haven't really gotten along his husband and wife in years ever since, you know, he had an affair with his, I'm sorry, her secretary while they were married. So she is the one who's going to go out and sort of traipse across America. Traipse is probably the wrong word. Um, she's going to explore America and see what the New Deal is doing well, what the New Deal is failing to do. And she's going to report back to Franklin about this. But she's not just reporting back to Franklin. She is so well liked in America that she has a daily newspaper column called My Day that she is going to sort of talk with America. This is her version almost of the um, of the fireside chat, except it's a it's a newspaper column that's read widely across the country. Um, she is also going to take her job as his eyes and ears and sometimes his voice um, further than some people might like. She pushes for pieces of legislation that she doesn't really have the ability to push for. Um, she's going to misrepresent some things to Franklin in order to get him to fund certain projects that in some cases will succeed wildly, despite the government not having really the legal ability to do that thing. And in some cases they're going to fail. But um, Franklin Roosevelt realizes that Eleanor is a great way to reach out to the country and be informed by this, and he's willing to make the concession that Eleanor is probably pushing the um, powers of the First Lady well past where they're supposed to be. But exceptional times call for exceptional measures, I guess, is the positive way you spin this, and the negative way is that Eleanor Roosevelt grossly jumped her powers as the First Lady and um, probably did some stuff she shouldn't have. 
uh, it really is just in the eye of the beholder there. It works both ways. Another person that we should talk about is Father Coughlin. Uh, Father Coughlin is a uh, Catholic priest in Detroit, and he starts out as a fan of the New Deal, and over time he sort of drinks too much of his Kool-Aid and goes very, very dark. Um, he's an anti-Semite, he does not like the Jewish people, and speaks out against them basically whenever given the opportunity on this radio program, that's quite a bit. Um, he's also going to turn against the New Deal and talk about how it's becoming communist and yada, 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 and how the Americans need to turn against Franklin Roosevelt. And he will become massively, massively popular at the time, along with um, another person uh, named Huey Long, who's a senator from um, Louisiana, and the two of them are going to sort of put a lot of pressure on Franklin Roosevelt to change stuff. In fact, the idea for Social Security in no small part comes from Huey Long. But this is just to say that Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt are not the only people making an impact on America at this time. With the advent of radio and um, newsreels, America is far more familiar with more people, and uh, those people have political viewpoints as well. All right, we are going to look at what happened with minorities at this point, which, um, long story short, it's not great. Um, women, the economic gains, um, the sort of ability they had to lead their own lives in the 1920s is going to roll back. Outside of secretarial jobs, the government bureaucracy expands. So, you know, you need more secretaries, you need more file clerks, you need more mailroom attendants, all that sort of stuff because the government is growing under the New Deal. Um, that's really the only place the jobs are going to pop up here. For the most part, women are not going to get hired into jobs they might have in the past simply because men are unemployed and it's viewed as unseemly for women to be employed when their husbands might not be. Also at the time, marriage rates are going to drop by almost 25% in large part because men and women don't want to get married when there's no real financial future ahead of them. Um, this is awesome foreshadowing for the baby boom that will happen after World War II when marriages are going to kick up again and the economy is back in gear. Um, as for African Americans, um, sometimes unemployed four times as much as white folks. So if we're looking at American employment at almost 25% at sometimes, you are looking at sometimes between 60 and 70% of African Americans being unemployed. Um, it's bad, especially in the South. Remember, the um, Great Migration is still happening. It's very slow. The Great Migration is going to continue to happen really until the 1950s. We'll talk about it in the next chapter. We'll talk about it in the chapter after that. Um, African Americans will continue to flee the South where they're being paid poorly. They're also going to organize into unions, not nearly as powerful as um, some other unions. That should say power, not poor, but you know what? We're doing this as we're doing it live. Um, but they will start to and show off some power. The biggest and most powerful, or at least the most famous, of these union leaders is a guy by the name of A. Philip Randolph, who we'll talk about again in the next chapter as well. A. Philip Randolph runs a group called the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, which are basically the uh, men that work in train cars when trains go on long journeys. There's a lot of them, and they have a fair amount of sway over the railroad industry, which is still booming at the time. So, A. Philip Randolph is able to throw his weight around and help to ensure that African Americans are not entirely mistreated. Um, he's well regarded by the American public, except for, you know, the super racists out there, and there's a lot of them. Um, he will get to be friendly with Eleanor Roosevelt, and he'll meet with Franklin Roosevelt a few times, and we'll actually talk about one of those um, in the next chapter. As for Mexican-Americans, this is where it gets really, really bad, actually. Um, they're competing in jobs uh, in California for jobs with the Okies and everyone else that's coming there. And the state of California and the federal government are going to deport thousands of Mexican-Americans. You did not misread that. That is not like Mexicans who are coming up here to work as seasonal labor. Literally, like, if you looked Hispanic, there was a decent chance we were going to run you out of the country for taking our jobs, despite the fact that wasn't actually happening and they were just as much American citizens as anybody else. A good number of them made it back to the country, but this is a stain on sort of Western or Southwestern American history that we don't really talk about that much. Um, they will come back and will become an integral part 
of the wartime economy, especially in Southern California. But during the Great Depression and the New Deal, it is a bad, bad time for Mexican Americans. Now, taxes went up during this time. We talked about that earlier. But stuff is still expensive, and those taxes are not popular. People don't enjoy paying taxes, even if it is helping keep a bunch of people employed and the economy trudging along. So what Franklin Roosevelt's going to do is he's going to say, hey, I want to get reelected in 1940. Um, so by mid-1937, really, he's going to start easing off the taxes. Say, hey, you know, been elected once already. I've been reelected. Um, business is booming. I'm going to take my hands off the taxes. We'll ease that up and people will be happy with me now. So by the time I run for election in 1940, people will remember me fondly as the guy who stopped all that high taxation, saved the country, and then stopped taxing as soon as it wasn't necessary anymore. But we've got a problem. He does it too soon. And as a result, the government is not taking in as much money. It's not providing as many jobs. It's not providing as many services. And we are going to get smacked with a second recession. So not quite as bad as the Great Depression, but pretty dang bad. Basically everything that had gone up, up, up during the New Deal crashes back down in 1937. Unemployment's going to rise again. Um, wages are going to fall. Basically Franklin Roosevelt and his economic advisors had too much faith in the fact that they had already saved the day. And it was only a couple people like Harry Hopkins out there saying like, no, we really need to keep at this for a while. We need to keep spending government money until the point where we don't think we have to anymore. And then we need to keep spending that money for a couple more years to actually get the economy back on sound footing. We can't pull somebody right back over the cliff and then just be like, okay, cool. So uh, we'll see you later. Bye. You can't do that. And so the second recession is going to hit. And combined with the court packing stuff, Franklin Roosevelt is not going to be particularly popular going into 1938, 1939, when he starts thinking about that 1940 run for a third term. So that leads us all up to the end here. And you guys will have a question on this on your Google Classroom, to which I need you all to respond. And it's, did this actually work? Was the Great Depression effective? Um, my answer here, sort of. Franklin Roosevelt's policies definitely get the ball rolling towards recovery, but the issues aren't completely solved by the Great Depression. Um, the Great Depression, it's, it's not fixed. Um, jobs get created, but it's really going to be World War II in 1939 that is going to see our future allies, uh, Russia and uh, England, and to a lesser extent France, asking for supplies that is going to pull us out of this second recession. So did it work? Sort of. But it is not solved. The Great Depression is not solved by the New Deal. We are helped out of it by the New Deal, but that's as far as we can really go with it. And that's where we're going to leave off. The next chapter is going to pick up with us taking a look again at what's happening in Europe and dragging us in to World War I. I'm sorry, World War II. Bad way to finish this off, but hey, whatever. We're going to get started on World War II next week. So, uh, as usual, questions, let me know, and uh, make sure you stay on top of your notes and any and all assignments that get posted in Google Classroom. See you later, folks.